Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for joining us um, and staying on after lunch. Um, I'm Shahoka Goto with the Wilson Center's Asia program. It's a great, um, with great delight that I'm introducing this panel today. Um, we've had the morning really talk about um, the, uh, the geopolitical implications of diplomatic success um, in dealing with North Korea from the perspectives of China and Russia and South Korea. We're now going to look at the downside risks or the diplomatic failures, so to speak, of um, engaging with North Korea from the perspectives of Japan and the United States and more broadly the alliance. I, this panel really needs no introduction, but from uh, my furthest right, um, I would like to introduce him because he's traveled the furthest. Not only has he had to deal with the snow and the possibility of the shutdown continuing, but he's also uh, crossed uh, 14 time zones and um, just arrived yesterday. Um, Nobumasa Akiyama, he is the Dean of the Graduate School of International and Public Policy and Professor at the Graduate School of Law at Hitotsubashi University, one of the premier universities in Japan. He's also a adjunct research fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. And he's also a, um, an academic and a practitioner and a very, very seasoned and senior uh, government advisor. He served as the minister counselor at the permanent mission of Japan to international organizations in Vienna. Um, he was a special advisor to the ambassador on nuclear security there. Um, I can go on about um, Professor Akiyama's um, many, many accomplishments, but the time is short. To his uh, to my immediate right is Patrick Cronin. This, I believe, is his debut in his new role as chair for a uh, public uh, debut as chair for the Asia Pacific Security, a newly created position at the Hudson Institute, where he is also a senior fellow. He was before then a, a senior director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at CNAS, the Center for a new American security, and he's also um, been at uh, numerous organizations, including the Institute for National Strategic Studies, um, and he was also the senior vice president and director of research at CSIS. Um, again, um, his his bio, his full bio, is in front of you, and it's a very very impressive um, CV. Uh, to in the middle is uh, Abe Denmark. He is uh, the director of the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. He also has a joint appointment as senior fellow at the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Before he joined the center, he was deputy assistant secretary of defense for East Asia. So um, with this very impressive lineup, I'd really like to start the conversation going. Let's turn first to Professor Akiyama, and we're in a panel about uh, talking about diplomatic failure with North Korea. Are you in the correct panel? Is this <laughs> what you would, would you have put yourself in this panel rather than the first one? Um, I asked because in the first panel, we, um, there was, Japan was briefly mentioned, but it had been briefly mentioned about being sidelined from the conversation. Japan's um, at very much at the center of the eye of the storm that is going on as a result of the uncertainties in North Korea. But how has Japan's position evolved since engaging in summit diplomacy? And can you give us an overview of how the situation is changing? Thank you very much for a kind, kind introduction. Um, as an academician at the university, uh, when I heard about the, this theme of this session, uh, my initial thought is about how to define the diplomatic failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a maybe bad habit of the uh, university academician to stick to the, the definition of the uh, specific languages, uh, but uh, uh, as a kind of a habit of of the university professor, let me start with uh, defining a couple of uh, the key concepts which may decide the 
the, the sort of a future or fate of this process. One, uh, so it seems to me that there are so many different uh, views on how to define the success and failure of the negotiation, depending on where you stand. Uh, it seems that, you know, maybe President Trump uh, have his own very unique view of the success, and you, you, maybe U.S. experts may have different view on success, and Japanese, South Koreans, and of course North Koreans are really different in terms of how to define the views uh, on the, uh, the failure and success. Of course, for us, two extreme cases. One is the situation, unfortunately, may escalate into the, uh, the military conflict, which definitely we have to avoid. The sec but the another uh, the opposite uh, extreme case is that maybe uh, the agreement without uh, concrete action uh, by North Korea toward the denuclearization. So uh, negotiation may end without any uh, concrete uh, sort of uh, uh, pro uh, progress in denuclearization. But maybe the reality is somewhere in between two extremes. So uh, the second, so then how do we define denuclearization and what would be the end game? I, to me, it's not so clear at this moment. But I think there is a kind of widely shared view that denuclearization probably means the complete elimination of nuclear weapon capabilities. And uh, of course, this, if we set this as a goal of the uh, negotiation, forth, I mean, forthcoming negotiations, then uh, it cannot be achieved in a one phase. Um, you know, Japan has been insisting on the uh, quick and one phase uh, completion of the denuclearization process. But uh, now I think Japan or Japanese government need to accept that the uh, uh, the denuclearization process will not end in a one phase, but it may take a couple of phases. But uh, given that the window of opportunity for the uh, negotiation with North Korea is not going to open forever, so I think it is a time for us to accept the reality and maybe we have to have a better design for the uh, phased approach for the denuclearization. And I think there are two uh, maybe three possible criteria to assess whether the uh, forthcoming negotiation would be ended up in success or failure. One, uh, in whether the deal will ensure the, the nuclear threat reduction and in, in terms of uh, nu nuclear weapon capabilities in North Korea. Or uh, if not the case, then uh, can we see any clear prospect for or the progress toward the denuclearization. And a second, the deal must be uh, a positive uh, to, to the, uh, the regional security, or at least a deal doesn't contain the, uh, uh, negative implications. So in particular, uh, I think it is important for us to see the, uh, the, the deal uh, which would maintain the, uh, the uh, alliance's role to reassure the partners and allies in the region, and also to shape the regional security order. And third, uh, the deal must be uh, politically acceptable and sustainable, in both in terms of domestic politics and in terms of alliance politics. And particularly, it is important to see the, the appropriate balance between the threat reduction measures taken by North Korea and the incentives that provided to North Koreans. And uh, as far as I see the media coverage on uh, some prospects for the forthcoming negotiations, there are several concrete, concrete measures appeared on the various articles. One is the, uh, um, and under these measures have already uh, in some uh, documents uh, like a, a I, you know, North Korea, uh, North South uh, de joint declaration, and so forth. But one is the shutdown of the uh, the nu nuclear material uh, production uh, facilities in Yongbyon, and two, uh, the closure of the the nuclear test site in Punggye. And the third is the closure of uh, a missile test site in Tonchari. 
and possible verifications of these uh, the actions. In addition, uh, for the U.S., I think very important benchmark is whether North Korea agrees to abandon the ICPM programs. So from Japanese perspective, uh, you know, these measures uh, seems, to, uh, seems that uh, it would hold the further increase of North Korean nuclear capabilities, but they do not address the, uh, uh, the existing nuclear weapon capabilities. So they, does, they do not necessarily uh, contribute to the threat reaction to us. So for us, what we'd like to see is the uh, threat reduction of the existing nuclear weapon capabilities. But so one thing, uh, it's a little bit uh, tricky, is the ICBM uh, abandonment. So there are positive and negative explanations or interpretations in terms of the uh, alliance uh, politics. In the pos uh, positive interpretation is that since the, IC the North Korea, if North Korea no longer possesses ICBM capabilities, then the, uh, the nuclear threat posed to the United States is significantly reduced or eliminated. So then the uh, United States may commit to the alliance, uh, security of the alliance assurance to the allies uh, without fearing the retaliation by North Korea. But the other side of uh, the another interpretation, which is rather negative, is that uh, United States may reduce the interest in further progress in the denuclearization process. Then uh, that may create uh, the threat perception gap between the United States and Japan. Uh, particularly, Japan is faced with the, uh, the threat of North Korean media intermediated missiles. So the. Uh, there is also a, a risk of decoupling between two allies. Then uh, important is, first, uh, if the ICB abandonment of the ICBM ever happens, then uh, obviously North Korea requires the appropriate reward to that. But I think we have to have very fine-tuned strike uh, uh, we have to strike a very fine-tuned balance between uh, you know, the threat reduction and reward that we are going to provide to North Korea. And so in a, I would like to emphasize that, that such a reward should not be the measure to undermine the uh, functions of the U.S.-Japan alliance in terms of the uh, that extended deterrence provided to, Jap to Japan and other allies in the region and the, the shaping the, the regional security order. And second, uh, I think the, uh, the, this uh, balance between the, the reward and the measures uh, may be a satisfactory measures to, uh, to the North Korean as well. In order to keep the sustainability of the deal, I think that is also an important element. And third, uh, um, I think the uh, United States, I mean, we would like to see, I mean, Japan would like to see the clear message from the United States to reaffirm the importance of the alliance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the allies and also vis-a-vis -vis other uh, the players in the region that alliance keep on playing a key role in the, the regional security. And fourth, I think it is important for us not to accept the sesame slice strategy of the North Korean uh, in negotiating for the next step of the denuclearization. And then, so what about the next step uh, after, you know, if uh, the deal, if it ever happens? So uh, for us, we would like to see the, uh, the clear commitment or maybe uh, more desirably the concrete roadmap for the uh, disarmament process and the nuclearization end. So I, I think so far, if the, these concrete measures which are floating at this moment are taken, then that is, that these measures are mostly the confidence building and arms control between United States and North Korea, and it, that they do not necessarily measures for the, uh, the nuclear threat reduction or uh, denuclearization. So uh, we would like to uh, see the concrete measures to 
actually reduce the threats, nuclear threats, including uh, the uh, maybe dismantlement of warhead stockpiles and possibly fissile material stockpiles. And uh, if possible at all, then uh, addressing the, the threat posed by the medium range missile. But to be uh, uh, realistic, uh, I don't think it's possible for us to force North Korea to abandon all medium range missiles because I think they are the keys to the North Korean security. So uh, then uh, if this the maybe the possible forthcoming deals fail to properly address these concerns, then now it comes to the, the diplomatic failure and it means that we may have to acknowledge uh, you know, even if you don't like, we don't like it, uh, the, the de facto nuclear weapon status of North Korea, and that may change our strategic calculation. This, and so, uh, in order to avoid it, and we have to make sure that decoupling between uh, in within the alliances would not happen. Uh, it is important for the security of Japan as well as for the uh, global security architecture. Uh, based on the U.S. kind of U.S. alliance-based security architecture, which is uh, very important not only for the, the regional players in Asia or in the Pacific, but also for the Europe as well. And second, it, it is important because uh, the uh, now strategic competition be, uh, against uh, the Russia and the United uh, against Russia and China are taking place at the global scale. And uh, in order to compete with these uh, strategic uh, competitors, the uh, alliances in the Indo-Pacific region and uh, uh, the uh, NATO in Europe are very critical. And all, it is important that all players in the alliance equally committed to the, such architectures. And also, uh, it, it, in, a, in a regional security context, it is important that the China, Chinese maneuverability should not be increased by the splitting uh, within the, uh, the allies of the, uh, the, in the region. And uh, finally, um, uh, it is at this moment awkward for the Jap for Japanese to say, but I think the relationship, uh, political relationship between or among Japan, ROK, and United States very critical. And as you are aware, the, uh, currently the, the, the political relationship between Japan and ROK is not so good, or I must say it's bad. Uh, but uh, hopefully that situation will be changed soon so that uh, you know, the three countries have uh, 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 on the same page vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and also to shape the security and strategic environment in the Indo-Pacific in, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for that um, perspective. Um, I want to get back to you um, later on the trilateral issue. But before that, if I could turn to Patrick and ask the same question that I did to Professor Akiyama, um, the, the challenges of defining uh, diplomatic success and failure uh, in we have a better understanding that there is a divide within the United States between the White House and the intelligence community as to what to expect um, moving forward um, in, uh, in dealing with North Korea. How would you, would you, would you have put yourself in this camp of um, diplomatic failure or do you see there is prospects for success in the future? Shihoko, um, thank you very much. Um, I, I never put myself in any camp. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to think um, through problems, and you've given us some great problems to think through. But let me answer your question. Um, and I have a forthcoming report from my old center, the Center for New American Security, along with my former colleague, Christine Lee, that looks at in states and looks at how to constructively try to salvage diplomacy for the next couple of years. And, and for me, this next summit um, will not be decisive. Um, this next summit will be indecisive. And so we're gonna be left asking the same questions, I suspect, after that next summit. Mm -hmm. But for the summit to have a modicum of success, sufficient success from a US policy perspective, as I would define it, we should pre-negotiate 
the specific one or two or three things that we want from the chem regime that would point toward the direction of denuclearization. And I can enumerate the different kinds of things. Then the question becomes, at what cost? What's the quid pro quo? Has to be at an acceptable cost. That's a separate paper, a separate conversation. Um, but if we did those things, um, that would be great. What I would do, and what I've written about in another article that's forthcoming this next week, is that if you want to succeed with North Korea, plan for failure. So I put myself in the failure camp in that regard, okay. that the best thing that policymakers can do is to think about the long-term strategic implications. We have tremendous diplomats like Mark Knapper. I've got great faith in Special Representative Steve Began and so many others who can mine the meticulous, tough details um, of negotiation. This is, you know, from the outside world, what can we contribute? And I, I didn't glom onto the words diplomatic failure as much as I did geopolitical implications. Mm -hmm. Because if this is a true question, and it should be, we should be doing more strategic thought. There is a deficit of strategy in this town. We keep spending more money, we keep doing more activity, but wh where is the strategy? And where's the strategy with our allies and with our partners or even our competitors? But that's where we need to put more attention to. So thinking outside of that box of the narrow diplomatic failure or success, um, let me just make some broader comments that I came prepared to. And I've written a long paper, but I haven't given it to you yet because it's, it's too long at this point. Um, but my remarks will be relatively brief. Um, it seems to me that Anytime anybody in this town or elsewhere talks about North Korea diplomacy, um, there is a dominant strand of either fear or indifference. Um, and the fear is often in a US policy context about we could lose it all here. We could lose everything we've been working for, especially since the Korean War when we lost lives and we entered that, uh, that armistice. We could lose our democratic allies. We could lose our position in Asia. Um, we could uh, lose our ability to contain a nuclear-seeking tyranny. Clearly, those would be lost. Those would be big losses. Nobody's expecting that to happen next week, but the point is that's a fear that's driving a lot of the criticism of North Korea thinking and policy. A uh, related fear is that we lose our geopolitical influence that we've had since we had victory in World War II, that we actually see a, this is triggering a retrenchment um, and the rise of China and its influence, and this is something even bigger. That's a fear, that's a geopolitical fear that is behind a lot of the criticism of, of policy and of, of thinking about it. A lesser included fears, and maybe more realistic ones in the shorter term, are smaller variations, relative loss of power, relative loss of influence, um, acquiescing to a nuclear arm North Korea, giving them more than we thought we were gonna give them when we were tightly containing them at the expense of our democratic alliances, at the expense of our strong forward military force posture. And many of these fears are also directed at individuals and personalities, right? And so it's the perceived, and this is not my view, this is, so do not quote this as my view, but the, per, of, the often perceived strategic incompetence of President Moon and or President Trump, and the perceived strategic competence of Chairman you know, Chairman Kim and Chairman Xi, right? I think that gives too much weight in the latter category, too much criticism to the former, but those are part of the fears that people are evoking, right? They don't trust Trump, they don't trust Moon, they don't trust Kim, good reason, they don't trust Xi, um, uh, you know, a, a big debate can happen. And yet, for all those fears, there's a lot of indifference. And the indifference is driven by the fact that we've been locked in a Cold War with North Korea, the United States, and our allies, locked in the Cold War in North Korea since 1953, and we really have not been able to change it. When we've tried to move toward rapprochement, sunshine, detente, we've been beaten back. We've, you know, it's failed. The options to go to war, as we were talking about with fire and fury, or at least hinting at, were not really good options. Uh, there's a lot of bluster, um, a lot of uh, deterrence maybe, a lot of uh, dissuasion going on, but, but not really a good option, and we pulled back because that wasn't really an option. When we've tried to go to direct peace, I mean, as more talked about from North Korean propaganda, perhaps, or others, that's not really been an option either. We're not going to forsake our security concerns, our alliances, our democracy, our way of life. Um, there's also a complacence about nuclear deterrence holding up. 
I mean, I've, I've made some of these arguments before that this is a pretty stable Cold War with North Korea. This is a pretty stable uh, nuclear situation. Nuclear armed states have not gone to war with one another openly. But that could change. <laughs> and, we, and we do know that miscalculation can happen. So it, it would be facile for me to say just because deterrence is possible to be sustained doesn't mean it's not dangerous. It is also a danger, um, and we have to recognize that. So we, are, we can be too indifferent to uh, the fact that we've been locked in a stable Cold War and that nothing could change, especially big geopolitical change, mm -hmm. right? But this is the second big point here, which is that we need to think about major geopolitical change because it is possible. And if you, if, if you just draw the history line longer, that, that stable Cold War we've been talking about and stability since the end of World War II well, if I, you know, minus the Korean War. I mean, but, you know, that's six decades to 75 years, depending on how you want to calculate the time here. But the point is, that's, that's a lengthy period of time. But why not think about 120 years? Why not think about 400 years? And if you think about 400 years, you know, yes, the geopolitical changes on the peninsula and in Asia have been tremendous over that longer period of time. So less than four centuries ago, Manchu invasion succeeded in making the Joseon dynasty a tributary of China's Qing dynasty. A century and a quarter ago, Japan's defeat of a weakened China put it into the dominant geopolitical position. But it was the Russian Empire's competition brought forward with a Trans-Siberian Railroad with its terminus in Vladivostok, and then getting a concession of Port Arthur, a warm water port, that essentially frightened Japan. Um, as one historian said, further expansion by Russia in the area aroused Japan's worst fears. Here was the very situation she most dreaded, the possibility of a first-class power securing a position of dominance on the near, nearby mainland. So that was the last time there was a real geopolitical play before Japan colonized Korea in the end of the war when the United States became dominant, along with division of the, the peninsula with the Soviet Union occupying the north. That was the last time, because once 1905 came around and Russia was vanquished, Tushima Straits, um, a war that Alistair Horn said took a half a year for the Russians to move their fleet in position and then a half an hour to lose. Um, you know, it, it changed their geopolitical fortunes a lot. If Russia had become the dominant power, we would be talking about a different geopolitical structure today, just as if we hadn't gone into Korea. And by the way, before we went into Korea, there were historians and there were others arguing that we didn't need to go there. Offshore balancing back in the 1930s and 40s was seen as sufficient before 1950. There were those even argued in 1950, the United States did not need to go and fight in Korea. So all of those things are possible in terms of different variations. We are not permanently locked in an international relations paradigm that will never change. It will change, and it is changing slowly, and that's probably the best thing to do is to be able to manage that change intelligently and slowly. Um, on the geopolitical side, um, I just want to say that it was Sir Alfred Mackinder, the English geographer, who never mentioned geopolitics, but he talked about the heartland of Eurasia and Africa, the periphery of the so-called islands of the Americas, Australia, Japan, the British Isles, and Oceania. That starts to evoke this offshore balancing concept that one would talk about today. That's real strategy that's based on geography that's really geopolitical. That may not be what you intended me to talk about today, <laughs> but that, that, is, that is a geopolitical shift that people need to be thinking about. Um, the, the fact is that if we had successful diplomacy, so-called successful diplomacy, um, if this breaks South Korea out of its island economy, so it's not just the shipping that we heard about this morning, but it's also on land. I think it does make a difference. And the question about the Belt and Road, I think, was maybe given too short a time to, to, to kind of illuminate. I think there's a real um, change that would be forthcoming from ending North Korea's prior status, attaching South Korea to the Asian continent, not just the maritime space, and um, conversely, maybe reducing the U.S. footprint and Japan's being marginalized as well, potentially, or not, maybe joining in um, through new infrastructure and, and new, new trade. But I think diplomacy could play a, a critical role here. Anyway, the three outcomes of diplomacy, not this next summit, but over the next two years, there will either be a path started toward a genuine peace agreement, and we can define what would be part of that. I think that's all negotiable, frankly. 
but it would have to be acceptable to all sides going forward over time. Um, but even genuine peace could be a failure geopolitically for the United States, especially if we do it badly. So this is going back to your question, what's success, what's failure? Even genuine peace, it's tough to say, could be completely antithetical to U.S. national security interests, could be antithetical to Japan's national security interests, um, may or may not be agreeable with Korea national security interests because it depends on how much influence North Korea has, how much influence China has maybe over their future. If we enter a phony peace, I don't see that as being sustainable. When we heard this morning from Robert that this could be a protracted event, it could be protracted, but I don't think that's automatic. If it's, if it's not effective diplomacy, that is if we're not marching in the direction of some serious meaningful steps on denuclearization, I think ultimately we just have to cut the, the wire on that one. Either it's enough, we're getting somewhere, or we're not, and it's not sustainable. There are too many impediments in the body politic of democracies to sustain that from administration to administration if you're not really moving toward a successful path. So it'd be, yeah, the next two years we could do a phony peace, you know, an ineffective peace, but not beyond that, I don't think. Um, then we get into the failed peace, and the failed peace talks could lead to the status quo ante of fire and fury, but as I've discussed, that doesn't really, that's not a real option for, for national security. I mean, it could happen, but <laughs> I, I didn't see it happening in 2017. I don't see it happening in 2020. Um, it's, it's not, it's, national security planners are too deliberate um, to do that. Um, but we could get into a situation of, of crisis, certainly, and of um, deterrence and containment not being as stable as, as it was before the fire and fury. And that maybe is the most likely. That's not quite fire and fury, but it's not as stable as it had been in deterrence and containment for, for years before. So um, that will be a, a require vigilance, and that requires strategy. It requires resources, and above all, as Mark Knapper pointed out, it requires allies. So let's keep our strategies and work on them. Let's make sure we expend the time and effort, uh, and let's make sure we keep strong alliances. So that's why I said, if you want to succeed with North Korea, prepare for failure. So thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And of course, um, the geopolitical landscape and the um, issues at stake are very high, but it's also on the economic um, sphere as well. And we are seeing this confluence of, of changing values, changing um, realities, and which are not necessarily being thought out in a strategic way. And so I want to turn to Abe. Um, Patrick um, had some tough love there, talking about the deficit of strategy vis-a-vis um, -vis North Korea, but writ more broadly as well. How would you assess the situation? Thanks, thanks, Shoko. And um, just to, to start, it's a, it's a real honor and thrill for me to share the stage with uh, three scholars who I just have incredible respect for and have for so many years. Um, so I'm just very glad to be up here with the three of you. Um, and for those of you out there, I was uh, uh, one of the 800,000 federal employees who were uh, furloughed. So um, I had a hand in planning the overall um, focus of the conference, but not in the specifics. So um, uh, Shoko asked Nobu if, uh, which, which panel he if he thinks he belongs in this panel, just because I'm here, don't make it think that I decided to be here. Uh, Shioka, I guess, thinks that I should be on this panel uh, <laughs> since she decided uh, to put me here. I got about 36 hours notice that I'm gonna be speaking today um, when I came back from this, uh, from, my, uh, from the uh, shutdown. Um, but uh, again, I, I think it's a great conference. I'm really glad that all of you are here. Um, and the broad point that um, I wanted to explore with this conference was to think about the that uh, how developments on the Korean Peninsula have implications uh, for the entire region. It's not just a story about the Korean Peninsula, but it has knock-on effects for the entire region. Uh, and again, if the United States, is, as Patrick said, if the United States is going to have a strategic approach to this, um, then they need to consider not only the dynamics between North and South Korea, but also the broader regional implications of all of this. Um, and when thinking about this, uh, for the beginning of my presentation, I also started thinking about uh, what we mean by failure, what we mean by success. Um, and I'm not going to really put myself in any camp, but to me, it struck me that um, China, Japan, and the United States have different definitions of what they would define as, uh, what they would call success, uh, in my estimation. To me, uh, for China, success would mean no war, uh, 
uh, and the, the things are in a diplomatic process. Um, and that seems to be fairly good enough for them. They'd like to see denuclearization, but it seems to me that their main goal is to avoid conflict and keep things in a diplomatic process. I thought uh, Nobu did a fantastic job of describing the Japanese position, um, looking to see threat reduction, wanting to maintain a robust American presence and commitment, uh, avoiding conflict, making progress toward denuclearization. And it strikes me that the Trump administration has, uh, um, uh, when we're talking about, uh, Patrick's talking about the dearth of strategy, uh, to, it strikes me that the Trump administration has voiced different definitions of what success would, would entail. Um, so Steve Began um, recently um, reiterated the call for the final fully verified denuclearization of the DPRK, um, which is sort of what the uh, working level the uh, folks have been deciding. But um, on Twitter um, today, the president um, des described what he sees as success, and I'll, I'll quote it, um, no testing, getting remains, hostages returned, decent chance of denuclearization. <laughs> wow. And that's where things are um, for that. So I, and, and there's a pretty big gap between those two <laughs> definitions of success. So um, to me, um, and we'll get into in the next panel, we'll look at how do we go forward. And a lot of this, I think, will depend on what do we define as good enough. Uh, are we going to say anything short of Full, final fully verified denuclearization is a failure because um, that will drive us in a certain direction. Or if we say something short of that, if we redefine success to be something short of that, that could potentially push us in a different direction. We'll explore those dynamics in the next uh, session. But I wanted to look at um, a few issues that we need to think about um, in the case of, of failure. And by failure in this case, I mean North Korea retaining nuclear capabilities, retaining the means to deliver them, uh, against our, our allies uh, in, in Asia and, and retaining a ICBM capability, although I'll talk about sort of the implications of that. Um, so first is uh, the return, and this is uh, some scholarship done by uh, a, a former colleague of mine from the Pentagon, Brad Roberts, um, when he was in Japan, did a fantastic uh, uh, look at the implications of a nuclear North Korea, looking at the return of some Cold War concepts that we had to deal with. Um, uh, uh, that kind of returning to the fore. Uh, the first being the stability-instability paradox, uh, what, what uh, political scientists call. Um, basically, the idea that North Korea, if they feel secure behind their deterrent, behind a nuclear deterrent, that they, they may feel free to act below the nuclear level, uh, act against South Korea, act against uh, the United States, uh, act against other interests, in the belief that no country would dare attack them militarily because they have this nuclear deterrent. Um, and so concerns about, uh, concerns about that. Uh, the other side being the fear of decoupling is something that uh, Nobu talked about, that um, allies may be concerned that because the North Koreans have these, uh, capabili the, uh, a nuclear capability, the ability to strike the United States with nuclear weapons, that they may be able to keep the Americans out, uh, which is a longstanding fear during the Cold War that we had to deal with uh, for several decades, and that, that might be coming back. Um, so I wanted to talk about those two specifically and, how to, and sort of what it may mean for, for the region, for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, first, in terms of the stability and stability paradox, ironically, as North Korea enhances its nuclear capabilities, um, it's my sense that deterrence on the strategic level is actually fairly stable in that North Korea knows that a, a large-scale attack will receive a, a significant response, um, that they can't use nuclear weapons without causing the end of their country. Um, and so on the, the nuclear side, I think there's le I have less concern about deterrence on the nuclear side than I have about deterrence on the conventional side. And when we talk about the stability, uh, the, uh, stability and stability paradox, I worry more about st stability and deterrence on the conventional side. So as if North Korea is able to retain these capabilities, um, I would be looking for the United States to work with its allies to enhance its ability to deter and respond to North Korean conventional uh, attacks, um, uh, sort of a limited scale conflict in a way that would drive us to really uh, change some of our force posture in a, in a, in a, in a somewhat, in, in some ways, in some significant ways. Uh, and on a, the decoupling side, and nobody mentioned this, the, the role of the ICBM in how our allies think about American con, uh, commitments. Uh, what's ironic, in this is that as North Korea's capabilities get better, our allies get more nervous whether or not the, the North Koreans have an ICBM. If they have an ICBM, there's the concern that the Americans could, could be kept out. 
if North Korea somehow gets rid of the ICBM, then allies can get concerned that the United States is no longer as interested as they were before. So to me, allies' concern about this is not so much about whether or not North Korea retains an ICBM, it's really about North Korea and the North Korean nuclear capabilities. Um, the United States dealt with North Korea without an ICBM um, for decades, was able to maintain deterrence even after they developed a, a, a limited North nuclear capability. Um, and the United States was able to maintain deterrence with its allies, reassure its allies within that context. And even during the Cold War for decades, the United States was able to maintain deterrence, reassure its European allies, even in the face of, of significant Soviet and then Russian um, ICBM capabilities. Um, so again, to me, this speaks to the broader challenge that we'll be facing, that we face now, that I believe is going to intensify in, in the coming years, uh, the challenge of reassurance, uh, reassurance of U.S. allies, something that I spent a tremendous amount of effort on when I was in the Pentagon, uh, working with uh, friends in Japan and Korea on, on reassurance. Um, the challenge, the need for reassurance, of course, never goes away. It's something that's, uh, that's part of any alliance relationship, but if North Korea is able to retain this capability, I think the demand for reassurance is going to uh, intensify to the point that the United States is not going to be able to just operate as it had before. It's no longer going to be business as usual. And the United States will need to think about how it conducts reassurance, how it reassures its allies uh, in ways that may be a bit more direct, a bit more, uh, a, a bit broader than we've uh, handled in the past. Um, the other piece I want to mention, I hinted at it before, and um, I'd, I'd wondered if someone would bring it up during the first panel. We talked about the implications of success. Um, but to me, whether or not there's success or failure on the Korean Peninsula, if North Korea completely denuclearizes in a fully verified way, uh, or if it's able to retain these capabilities, either way, in my mind, it will have implications for American force posture in the region, uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula, but also in Japan. Uh, and, and, and more broadly, because the, the threat is changing. Uh, North Korean capabilities are evolving. They're getting better in some ways. Uh, the threat posture is evolving. And the United States will need to evolve its force posture as well uh, and think about uh, how to structure our force posture in, in, those, in those cases. So to me, that has implications not only for our force posture in Korea, but also looking at Okinawa, looking at Australia, looking at the other, in Hawaii, the other places of how the United States constructs its force posture, I think, will also need to evolve as the North Korean threat evolves, either positively or negatively. And it's something that ha hasn't been discussed a lot. Um, and so the last point I wanted to make, and we'll get to the, like, what happens going forward in the next panel, but the last piece I wanted to make is, um, as far as strategy goes, I want to build off of Patrick's point here. Um, so much as the Trump administration has been able to uh, describe a strategy for, for Asia, it has been uh, very much focused on competition with China, um, both, uh, both in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Competition with great powers, competition with China was a major theme, up to the point where in the national defense strategy it was pointed out that uh, great power competition was now a higher priority than uh, countering uh, international terrorism, which is, a, I thought, a very striking uh, statement. Um, how does this fit in with uh, diplomatic failure with North Korea. How does the United States balance these two strategic imperatives? Um, in one hand, we're trying to compete with China, enhance our ability to compete with China. But on the other hand, trying to manage a much more difficult, in the case of diplomatic failure, a much more difficult si um, situation on the Korean Peninsula in which the role of China is also changing, in which China has um, been much more open and much more forthright in its support for North Korea, in which Leaders apparently in both in Beijing and Washington see the Korean Peninsula through the lens of great power competition with the other. How does the United States position itself so that it can deal with this situation in North Korea, but also more broadly enhance its ability to, uh, to, to compete with China? I think that will become a more uh, striking challenge going forward, um, really regardless of how things, whether North Korea improves or gets, or, uh, gets worse. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave some comments and, and thoughts about where we go forward for the next panel. Um, but broadly speaking, I completely agree with the points that both Nobu and, and Patrick have made, especially about the need for strategy and the, the need for a broader regional strategy. Um, in, the first, uh, in the first half of the Trump administration, I've grow, I grew concerned for a while that uh, the U.S.-Asia strategy had become a North Korea strategy uh, and that so much of American efforts in, in Asia was 
oriented around pressure on North Korea. Uh, now it's unclear where it is. Um, but if the United States fails to have an integrated strategy that deals with both North Korea, with China, and, and, both, and really enhances the roles of our allies and partners in the region, I think that the United States is going to continue to struggle uh, to deal with this challenge. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abe. Um, turning to, um, back to Professor Akiyama, Abe discussed great power competition, but at the same time we're seeing um, smaller regional competition, especially between Japan and the ROK. How does the latest tension between Seoul and Tokyo impact the development of regional strategy? Um, thank you. Uh, it's a very sensitive question, and, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but just uh, I'm still trying to figure out what would be the implications. But uh, if allow me to introduce the atmosphere in Tokyo, um, the, it seems to me that there is a growing kind of a at atmosphere among the security experts that we have to be prepared for a situation where the, uh, the ROK may lose interest in the security partnership with Japan or with the United States. And uh, I think that was reflected to some extent in the uh, statements. And, uh, uh, you know, in Japan, there was a kind of a news that the Prime Minister Abe did not mention uh, 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 South Korea in his uh, speech at the Diet. And then uh, in uh, Japan's national se security strategy, the reference to the Korea uh, came, uh, South Korea came after ASEAN even. So, uh, so in uh, the policy, security policy community, um, the, uh, the emphasis is shifted toward in the Pacific and the Quad rather than uh, Japan, US, ROK uh, partnership. But uh, it, to me, it is not the uh, right direction. And uh, despite of such a political rhetoric, I think at the other, functionally, um, I think our experts are also thinking about how to kind of reestablish a uh, very strong uh, security cooperation among three, because I think it is very important, even vital, to sort of uh, shape North Korean behavior and also uh, the, the future of the denuclearization. So uh, I don't really can uh, I cannot really provide you with a, a persuasive uh, account on what's really going on, what will be the security, uh, what will be the policy implications. But this is what I see in Tokyo. Mm. If you have focused on. Um, giving reassurance to U.S. allies. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you see the situation? Um, oh, 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 right. oh, please, yeah. go, go, go. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, just uh, let me add that the, uh, um, uh, so in exchange for such a kind of uh, reducing uh, kind of uh, emphasis on Japan, ROK alliance, I think now, you know, we have a more growing uh, interest and reassurance provided by the United States and how we are going to strengthen the U.S. Japan alliance. And somebody even like touched upon the possibility of drawing once uh, uh, redrawing the Atchison line to re reaffirm. So um, that is kind of a way how you know some uh, security experts explains the importance of U.S. Japan alliance. But of course, that is not the way, in my view. That, that the alliance should go, mm -hmm. I think the trilateral cooperation is still important and vital. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So and and j just let me add, um, at the same time, Japan is fi 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 finding a lot of um, domestic um, changes as well, not least that there is an election that is coming up in the upper house and the possibility of a double election with the, both the lower and the upper house. Um, that could, uh, would that have any um, impact, do you think? Well, <laughs> I think um, for uh, this, uh, uh, the relationship with uh, the ROK may have little impact on the election. Mm. I think the uh, 
it's more about uh, domestic agenda such as an economy and then uh, uh, some uh, misconduct by the bureaucrats or government and so there are a lot of other things that the voters may want to focus on but the uh, the more uh, uh, critical is about the perception among the uh, security and the foreign policy experts and particularly uh, the uh, uh, the Korean uh, a decision by the Korean court on the uh, re possibly reopen the uh, the the sort of a 65 uh, uh, Japan ROK uh, you know peace and uh, the, the treaty uh, that is a kind of big blow to the confidence about uh, the relationship between Japan and ROK. Thank you. Yeah, the um, on the. ROK Japan relationship, um, the domestic politics of both countries um, sort of pushes pushes them away from each other, um, and that without without uh, an external force, um, th these sorts of things I think are, are going to happen. Unfortunately, um, I think the what's been happening with between Japan and Korea, I think is very distressing and very and very disappointing. And I'm not taking a position on um, on who's at fault. Um, but just the, the the broader context of what's been happening, I think, has been very disappointing from an American perspective. And the end result is really only to um, damage the national security of Japan, of South Korea, and of the United States. Um, and I, I understand, it as as uh, Nobu said, that um, there is still hope of being able to work on the, the working level, uh, sort of at the lower level, being able to continue to work trilaterally. Um, my concern is that um, th uh, things have gotten so bad that uh, the, the Jasomia is now under threat. Yeah. And if, if the two sides were to back out of the Jasomia, um, then that would have a real impact um, across all levels. And again, it would only serve to um, hurt our national security um, really, without, and, uh, really without much uh, positive benefit. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the role of the United States in this. And something, it's not something get, that gets discussed much, but um, one of the external factors that can help keep, these, help keep Japan and Korea together uh, has been the United States. During the Obama administration, uh, there was a tremendous amount of effort put in to, uh, push, to um, encourage closer relations, closer working relations between these. And um, I think you know, the, the prime minister and president um, deserve a tremendous credit for the political risk that they took to improve the relationship. But um, recall that the uh, United States also played a role in, bring, in bringing those two countries together up to the role of the, the president of the United States intervening and encouraging his counterparts um, to improve the relationship and take this brave step. And that's a leadership role that we've not seen. And I think we're seeing the results of that absence of leadership. Um, from Japan, I think um, I was very pleased to see uh, Japan just released the uh, national defense program guidelines, I think they're called. I mm -hmm. don't always get the names of those right. but. Um, I thought it was a very welcome um, uh, step in how Japan's defense uh, community thinks about uh, the role of the self-defense force um, and the, the, the ambitions that they set. I hope that, um, we're, that they are able to um, make progress on the ambitions that they set for themselves um, and that the United States can help with that. And I also hope to see continued progress on Prime Minister Abe's broader ambitions um, for the role of the SDF. Um, I have always been a, uh, one who um, hoped to see uh, uh, many of our allies, and especially Japan, uh, play a broader role, uh, do more as, as allies. And um, I think uh, Japan has been heading in the right direction for some time, and something that I've been uh, very pleased about um, in terms of how they think about their own role in, in the region and, and the, the role of the uh, self-defense force. Um, but things like what's happening with uh, Japan and the ROK um, is very distressing and really only damages the interests of all three countries. Um, let me just start with the um, uh, agree that you, you cannot have Japan discount the importance of relations with the ROK and trilateral relations with the ROK and U.S., and you can't have South Korea do the same with Japan and Japan and the U.S. without undermining the interests of all three countries. So that's why it's important for the United States to do what I think Mark Knapper only hinted at, which is to say there's tremendous convening authority for the United States, that is to get together <laughs> quietly 
and to try to prevent a snowballing effect. So it's one thing for internal justice system of Korea to determine about the comfort women issue and reparations essentially and upset Japan, but at least that's an internal independent institution inside Korea. As one issue, it can be managed. But then you have the fire control lock-on in December, and that drove the Japanese crazy because in, in numerous meetings with the South Koreans, they were not getting even an acknowledgement that this had happened. In fact, the competing videos that went out from the two countries um, made it look like they were fighting in public sphere over which version of reality happened. Um, from a U.S. perspective, uh, where I hope policymakers are and where I hope people like Ambassador Harry Harris are very able ambassador in Seoul who knows Japan so well, as knows the Pacific so well, you know, can get together with the leading national security officials in both countries and say, look, how do we avoid instance, incidents like this happening? How do we deal with them instantly? How do we communicate instantly when they do happen so that this doesn't happen again, whatever happened doesn't happen again, so that we can manage down? Because we cannot afford for this then to spill over, as Abe just said, into undermining the years that went into negotiating, Abe was part of that, negotiating an intelligence agreement so that you can actually share secrets between Seoul and Tokyo, our two key allies. Um, there are two strategies, coming back to the big point here, there are two strategies going on, and this Abe hinted at this. With South Korea, we're so focused on North Korea and the future of the peninsula, and Japan is feeling marginalized from that process. It should not be marginalized, it needs to be part of it. And then the other strategy is this free and open Indo-Pacific. Yes, it's much more comfortable for Japan to talk to India and Australia and the U.S. and to talk about broad Indo-Pacific because Korea can be very difficult for them. Um, and for Korea, it can be very easy to ignore Japan because they're focused on the inter-Korean dialogue. But that cannot happen. As I mentioned briefly, even in my history, uh, there is an inevitability of being neighbors, and we have two vibrant democracies and economies, as Mark Knapper pointed at lunch, um, that are, for better or worse, part of a great San Francisco Alliance system that are in our interest to adapt and to perpetuate. That, that will give us all much more influence in this uncertain terrain that lie ahead, that, that we don't know where it's going, but, but at least if we work on it together, we could get to one more unified strategic vision of how to, how to get there, rather than to let us be essentially uh, fragmenting uh, our, our scarce resources. Thank you. All right, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, there is a microphone. If you could um, wait for someone to come with a microphone and then identify yourself, that would be great. I see Marvin there. Uh, Mar <clears throat> Excuse me, Marvin Ott, formerly federal government, now Wilson Center. Uh, the title of the panel was The Implications of Failure. Uh, so in the interest of be maybe a bit provocative, but sort of grab that by the throat. Uh, implications of failure. Uh, one implication: this would be a scenario that support for Prime Minister for President Moon craters in South Korea. Political support shifts to the conservative right, and one outcome of that is rapidly growing support for the nuclearization of South Korea. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's in the United States' interest or global interest to see further proliferation of nuclear weapons, but um, I don't think that's an unrealistic uh, scenario in the sense that there has been marginal but still steadily growing support, I think, within South Korea that's been borne out by Asan Institute polls and others that, yeah, they, there would be interest in a nuclear weapon, especially in the conservative part of the spectrum in South Korea, if... North Korea is allowed to keep building nuclear weapon systems, and South Korea is not sure about the nuclear umbrella, the, the decoupling effect that, that uh, Abe was worried about. So it's in the U.S. interest, therefore, to work on the reassurance that Abe talked about uh, and that Professor Akiyama has talked about in terms of um, maintaining the stability because uh, Japan would then be left with a very stark option as well, that it's looked at in its history and it's always found that it's not in the interest of Japan uh, to acquire nuclear weapons. In, in fact, it's the opposite, to be a leader on nonproliferation, and that's what Japan has done quite successfully internationally, but it would be put in a very tough spot, and so you'd have this cascading nuclearization effect that would be, would be indeed a failed outcome. I think you're right, Marvin. Yeah, if I could uh, just build on that, I agree with what Patrick said. I, uh, 
you know, I never make um, uh, predictions about how future elections will go. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's safe to say that it, at some point, conservatives will win in Korea. Right? At some point. <laughs> right. um, oh. And one of the, um, one of the dynamics I, I noted uh, after the first Singapore, after the Singapore summit, after the first meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong Un, was in my conversations with uh, South Korean uh, conservatives, uh, a real sense of, of uh, almost betrayal that they felt about the United States. Um, that when the president unilaterally gave up exercises, when the president talked about his desire to pull American troops out of Korea. Um, I think that that hit home, I think, a lot for, for conservatives. So I think, th I, I worry, I don't know how it'll happen. I think there's a lot of ifs between now and then, but I worry that um, if uh, conservatives in Korea, uh, and more, more broadly if the Korean people continue to uh, see the United States as not reliable and see the United States as not committed uh, to their defense, um, that that will fundamentally change not only how progressives in Korea look at the United States now, but also how conservatives, who are generally much, have historically been much more closely tied and, and much more confident in the United States, um, that their opi opinion may change. And that may drive a, a, uh, broader, uh, a, a broader look at, at uh, indigenous nuclear weapons, which is why, as I mentioned before, as Patrick mentioned, I think reassurance not only is essential now as it always has been, but um, if things continue to go in the path that they have been, I think will be an even more significant requirement for the United States to reassure its allies, both in, in Seoul and in Tokyo. Thank you. So uh, quickly, um, uh, you know, we, if we talk about uh, the, the nuclear cascade starting from North Korea, I think we may think about uh, the, the cascade beyond the region, it's a global impact. Mm -hmm. So I think the potential proliferators are carefully watching what the United States would do to North Korea and maybe make a comparison with the, the U.S. policy toward uh, Iran. And then uh, obviously there, is a, there are kind of inconsistencies between U.S. policy toward the uh, attitude mm. toward DPRK and uh, Iran. So I think potential proliferators, particularly in the region, the Middle East, are you know watching what what happens in North, uh, the negotiation with uh, North Korea. And secondly, um, if uh, we talk about the uh, denuclearization uh, of the Korean Peninsula, we may be reminded that we, there is a, a 92 joint, North-South joint yeah. declaration on the, the denuclearization of the, uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, even though the North Korea declared that that, uh, that joint declaration is was dead in the 2003, but uh, uh, the language uh, the, of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula reminded us of that uh, joint declaration, and that includes the, uh, the uh, uh, abandonment of the nuclear fuel cycle activities on the both in South and North uh, Korea. So uh, I'm curious how this document will be dealt with in the context of negotiation. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Dr. Kav Malik again. Um, it, my, my question actually goes, uh, comes perfectly on time uh, uh, concerning um, Abe's previous and maybe even current deliberations on changing the constitution and the implications uh, as far as uh, its uh, pacifist uh, orientation as, uh, now and into uh, what, what Abraham was talking about later on, a more proactive involvement in global affairs vis-a-vis uh, -vis its military as well, which could have significant geopolitical impacts in, in the region and beyond as well. So w what are your views? I, I think for all of you, because you've, you've been thinking about this quite a bit before. Thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, currently, uh, even though uh, Mr. Abe is enthusiastic about uh, uh, the amendment of the constitution, I think the political environment in Japan is not so forthcoming. And then uh, I think Mr. Abe's in intention to change the constitution is to avoid kind of circus interpretation of Article 9. And uh, uh, also, uh, secondly, I think maybe our government could do more 
to further increase its security role in the region, a, a positive role in the region, without uh, changing the constitution. So I think at this moment, what our government need to, need to do is to focus on the expan expansion of the security role of the self defense forces and our government as a whole uh, in order to stabilize the region uh, within the current constitutions and uh, obviously the, the interpretation may change depending on the changes of the international environment and then uh, uh, maybe it's desirable in the future that the uh, the interpretation uh, the, the the text of the constitution may be changed in order to fit into the reality but uh, uh, instead of uh, spending a political capital to such a controversial political issues, I think uh, the government, in my view, maybe want to focus on more substantive kind of a contribution to the regional security. Yes, I, I, uh, I, I don't take a position on uh, Japanese domestic politics. I think whether or not they should amend the constitution is up to the Japanese people. I just. My position as an American, and as an American who thinks about strategy in, in Asia, um, I think uh, the security of the United States and the security of Japan and the stability of the region would be uh, greatly enhanced uh, should uh, Japan be able to um, play a more significant role in Asia, um, both diplomatically, economically, politically, culturally, and, uh, and uh, through the SDF, through the uh, Self-Defense Force. Um, and whether or not that requires an amendment to the Constitution, I think, is, is up to uh, the Japanese people. Um, but uh, issues like collective self-defense, issues like uh, Japan being able to act uh, on its own uh, to enhance stability, to defend itself, um, I think are, are, would be um, a, net, a net positive um, for their interests, for our interests, and for regional stability. And I won't weigh in on the Constitution either because I see it as secondary to really the uh, shifting balance of power in the region. If you think about the sixth National Defense Program guidelines that Japan just issued this past month that Abe Demark uh, referenced, um, it is a logical progression in terms of it does call for an effective, truly capable defense, but it's, it's just an incremental improvement um, that we've been seeing over the decades that the self-defense forces have taken, and they're still very much restricted by the fact that Japan, even to this day, even in while they announce every year a bigger budget, it's still under 1% of GDP, and it has been since 1962, um, less than 1% of the gross domestic product of, J of Japan. Meanwhile, next door in China, the People's Liberation Army is on a fairly rapid, major, comprehensive, and not just military, but uh, a whole of government kind of paramilitary buildup. Um, that is quickly dwarfing the numbers that Japan has and even the East China Sea and elsewhere. So Japan is not racing uh, with arms. Uh, whatever happens with the constitutional debate, um, it's sort of a political decision, yes, laced with history, laced with uh, other implications, but Japan has been a responsible um, major player in, in the post-World War II system. It's going to continue to play that. Um, but it is limited in how many resources it has and has to therefore work with the United States, work with Korea, if we're going to try to shape these larger challenges that we face in terms of trying to snatch sort of uh, conflict on the peninsula and, and turn it into something more peaceful uh, in terms of managing China's rise in a way that it can be constructive for all and preserve our prosperity and, and stability without war, but deter and dissuade uh, challenges to the status quo with, through force and coercion. So we, we need, and the United States needs and wants Japan to be that effective defense, uh, diplomatic, economic power. Um, the constitutional debate is very much an internal debate within Japan. <laughs> okay. Um, the gentleman with the tie right in the middle. The tie in the um, middle. <laughs> Most people have ties, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> right in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Joshua Nizam, geopolitical consultant. Uh, Dr. Cronin, uh, one of your statements is ringing in my mind, and that is that a diplomatic success could lead to a geopolitical failure. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, do you have a scenario in mind? And does this suggest that perhaps there's a growing divergence of interest between the United States and our South Korean allies? I'm talking about what's possible, not, uh, you know, so this is where it's dangerous, of course, because I do talk about current policy a lot, um, but I came here more to kind of think outside of the, the containment of uh, current policy. Uh, 
And the fear would be um, <coughs> that, yes, North Korea does enough denuclearization movements without actually denuclearizing to convince the Trump administration that the peace is here, to convince President Moon that peace is here. He's already convinced, I think. Um, and, and that we um, arbitrarily withdraw our presence. Um, and everybody nominally could say this is a success. Um, and maybe in the long term it would be successful, but I have my serious doubts. I would think we would be opening ourselves up to dramatically reduced strategic influence in one of the, and really the, 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 the sort of the hub of 21st century power. Um, we would be abandoning uh, Japan, in effect, to uh, and really leaving our leaving them much more exposed to China as well as to North Korea. Um, we would be letting South Korean government be driven by this current South Korean government rather than the bipartisan uh, kind of nonpartisan or multipartisan uh, sort of support that needs to happen over time in our democracies, both here and in South Korea, to negotiate with North Korea in an intelligent way. So it could, it could strike a successful deal on the surface. Successful, it could be called successful, but it would be very unsuccessful. Now, having said that, theoretically as possible, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because there are too many intelligent men and women inside and outside of the government in our democracies that will put roadblocks in the way and that will call questions and will have, Congress has a huge role to play. People inside the administration, people inside our alliances, democratic changes. So fortunately, our democracies look like they could slip in that direction. And yes, it is possible we could announce that kind of direction at a high level. We could tweet it, but it, <laughs> but it, would, but it would not be implementable, right? It would not be implemented. It could still do some damage. Um, and I don't, I'm against doing damage, but it's not saying this is going to lead to the geopolitical sweeping changes that I suggested have happened in history and could well happen in the, in the coming decades, but uh, I don't see it happening, happening accidentally. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot more thought. But a bad economy at home, you know, a, a, a bad politics between Seoul and Washington, also between Tokyo and Seoul, the right sort of suave, you know, diplomacy coming out of, the, of North Korea, you know, sounding good, uh, making the motions, China pushing forward, Russia pushing forward to help with get the United States off the peninsula, bad politics. Yeah, those things could be the perfect storm that could line up. You could have a successful deal uh, on the surface, um, although I doubt in the American body politic that would be ultimately called successful. But, you know, the world might be saying, hey, this has been a peaceful change. We've brought North Korea from pariah nation into the comedy of nations. Let's take one last question. Um, yes, the gentleman in the purple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good eyesight. John Sandoz, uh, independent consultant. Given uh, the, the topic of this discussion, failure of the ways that, that diplomacy could fail here. What do the panelists view as Russia and China's uh, efforts to promote that failure? And uh, either through overt diplomacy or, or uh, covert efforts, information efforts in Japan, in South Korea, uh, and in the, in the broader uh, West Pacific. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, with regard to the uh, covert efforts, uh, particularly information warfare in Japan, I'm not specifically aware of any concrete examples, though I heard some about uh, some rumors about it. So I can really confirm that that is actually happening. But uh, obviously, there is a growing. Uh, concerns about it, but uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, roles that China and Russia may play in the process of denegotiation and denuclearization, I think the uh, and the, the interesting news in this morning, which was touched upon in the previous session about uh, Russia's offer to uh, provide two reactors to North Korea, uh, you know. 
I think such a uh, uh, kind of irregular uh, act by uh, Russia may change the, uh, the North Korea's calculation. But still, I think the primary interest of North Korea is to get a kind of security guarantee from the United States. Uh, so uh, even though maybe the equilibrium bit of the, uh, the uh, incentives and uh, uh, the uh, the denuclearization measures may be affected a little bit, but I think the other uh, it won't affect so much on the uh, the grand uh, what's a bargain uh, between North Korea and the United States. But I think the China's role is more critical, and I think even though the relationship between China and North Korea is not so good compared to in the past, in the past, but still I think as we see that the, you know. The North Korean leader visited China uh, before the, uh, the this uh, current process started. Uh, so that shows us that the, the to what extent uh, uh, the North Korea see China as a kind of a guarantor of their positions, and even though their trust on China is not so so uh, big, but still I think they have to rely on China. So and China probably will exploit such a position in order to secure its strategic interest, which is not to push the North Korea toward the United States and uh, uh, keep the, uh, the North Korea as kind of buffer zone, a strategic buffer zone between uh, China and the United States. I, I think that China and Russia have a, are in a bit of an awkward position when it comes to these negotiations and that they see the nuclear issue as an issue primarily between North Korea and the United States. And so their message is often, you need to negotiate with the, with, to the Americans, their, their message is, you need to negotiate with the North Koreans. But at the same time, they don't want to be cut out. So the message is often a, you need to negotiate between each other, but you also need to include us at times. Um, and so um, I don't know whether the, the story about the Russian offer of a nuclear power plant is accurate or not, but. Uh, to me, it, it's, it, whether or not it's accurate, it speaks to the broader theme of Russia wanting to be involved and wanting to make sure that they, they keep a, a hand in. Uh, similarly with the Chinese, uh, they want to make sure that they're not going to be cut out. And I think a lot of uh, Xi Jinping's engagement with Kim Jong-un is to the point of um, uh, s sending a message that China has a key interest in, in, in where things go. Um, but I don't think they have an interest in seeing negotiations fail. I think, given their druthers, they prefer um, denuclearization. They prefer to see uh, any process uh, re remain in a diplomatic lane. Uh, they get more nervous when uh, Americans start talking about fire and fury um, or other versions of that in the past. Uh, the potential for the United States starting a conflict or North Korean starting a conflict um, is something that they try they, that I believe they want to avoid. Um, rather, I think. They're kind of, they seem to be comfortable, as long as things are in a diplomatic process, whether or not it's making real progress is, to my, to my sense, is somewhat secondary in their minds um, to making sure that peace is maintained and that diplomacy is ongoing. And, and I agree with what was said. So there's so, some overlap of interests, obviously, in avoiding the worst case outcomes, but in reality, for dealing with a lot of the other part of the negotiation scenarios, the testimony that was given yesterday by the intelligence chiefs would suggest a Russia and China that doesn't have our best interests in mind. <laughs> and, it, and it sort of strains credulity to think that we have an INF treaty problem, we have a Venezuela problem, we have a South China Sea problem, a Taiwan problem, and yet when it comes to North Korea, they're completely on our side. No. <laughs> and, and I don't think anybody inside government is deluded and thinks that's the case. So um, I just think outside perceptions sometimes can be black and white. And the reality is it's complicated. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, China wants to retain influence on the peninsula. It wants growing influence, both for historical reasons, because the China dream is coming. Um, why does Xi Jinping want to have more summits than Moon Jae-in with Kim Jong-un? You know, he now has had four in, in China. Um, whereas before, we talked about inter-Korean peace uh, breaking out in early last year. Um, they had kept Kim Jong-un outside of China. Um, he had not been able to travel there in his six years uh, as chairman. Um, and similarly with Russia, um, they've been very opportunistic and eager to, to play a role and 
Uh, and, and a lot of it, frankly, I believe is related to the illicit economy, to intelligence sharing that is not our interest um, and doesn't have our interest in mind. Um, but I can't prove that. And so, you know, I'll just pile on to the intelligence estimates yesterday saying there's, let's at least ask hard questions and be very suspicious about whether those countries are being the adults in the room. That we, phrase we heard this morning, I think the United States is the adult in the room. I think South Korea is the adult in the room. I think so Japan's the adult in the room when we are acting our best and talking together about a strategy for managing the North Korean problem. Okay. So with that, um, the, we've come to the end of our session. There is a third and final panel discussion. Um, we will take a quick break for about 10 minutes. There is coffee outside, but um, if you could come back then, that would be great. And in the meantime, if you could join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great pleasure and honor, as always.